Sam. And I'm looking for a creature that's pretty hard to spot in the day, but easy to find at night. Let's play a little game of hide and seek and go find this green moray eel. I'm here at the National Aquarium in Baltimore, Maryland. And I can't wait to find the green moray eel. But first, whew, uh -huh. let's get suited up. My dive buddy, Holly, tells me we're going to find not one, but two green moray eels, Oscar and Felix. Time to play hide and seek with this green moray eel. Let's go. Wow, it's amazing down here. Look at all the fish. That's a giant hogfish. And this little guy staring at me is the Atlantic Big Eye Fish. I see why they got their name. I'm getting lots of fish love down here, but I don't see the moray eels yet. They must be hiding. Holly's going to feed him some squid so we can take a closer look. Wow! He's massive! Look at how he opens and closes his mouth. He's eating right out of the bag. Once he's done eating, he heads back to his hiding spot. Now we see him. Now we don't. Bye, Oscar. Holly, that was so cool. It was, it was really fun. It was like one of the coolest things I've ever seen in my life. Being so close to that eel and seeing all those fish was so exciting. There's so much more I want to know. Woo! Nice dive. Now, let's talk about some awesome creatures we saw down there. Sure, the green moray. Green moray. Okay, so what's the difference between Felix and Oscar? Felix is the smaller of the two. Okay. And Oscar is the larger and older of the two. His eyes uh, on Oscar are all more cloudy if the animal has cataracts, so they look a bit cloudy. Okay. Oscar's significantly bigger than Felix. Yes. Oscar's could probably, I'm about five, six in height, uh -huh. probably at least five feet in length. That's really big. So what do they tend to usually eat? When do they eat and what do they like to eat? They are usually nocturnal animals, which means okay. they are night feeders. So okay. morays like to hunt at night, mm -hmm. and they use more of their sense of smell. Mm -hmm. They may also eat things like your squid or your octopus. Mm -hmm. There is something interesting that I know eels do, which isn't very common, but when they hunt, what do they do with their bodies that is so spectacular? Okay, so a moray will actually tie themselves in a knot. Like okay? a real knot? Like, like a nut. They'll loop themselves, and when it unknots, that back pressure or vacuum, when it's grabbed the animal, helps it to suck it in again. So it's almost like its way of creating a vacuum. To securing the food. <laughs> yes. Now, oftentimes during the day, you'll see morays sitting in holes or crevices, and they're yeah. slowly opening their mouth. So this motion is how they actually breathe. A fish swim around, whereas a moray tends to lie at the bottom. A moray is not moving. They're much more sedentary. Okay. So sedentary means more relaxed. Okay. They sit at the bottom. Okay. And they have like these little red, orange phalanges coming out of the filaments. Holes. It's the gill filaments. The filaments actually help extract the oxygen from the water. Okay. So all the animals in that the exhibits here and in the ocean 
need oxygen. To right. Breathe. Okay, Holly. Trick question. What color are green moray eels? So green morays are actually brown. They have a yellow mucus over them, and a combination of those two colors give you the green effect. Okay, guys, what did we learn today about the green moray eel? Oh, I remember. We know that eels like to open and close their mouths to breathe. Another cool thing is that they hide in caves. So it's really fun to go in there and try and search for them. I guess we did find the green moray eel. Or should I say, brown moray eel. It's been fun. See you next time. Hey guys, it's me, Sam. Okay, we're going on a dangerous dive down deep in there to check out a species of fish that's been ruling the waves since the age of the dinosaur. Have you seen it? It has beady eyes, a pointy fin, really sharp teeth, and it likes to patrol the waters. That's right, you guessed it. It's a giant. Shark? You mean this little guy? Okay, well, maybe a not so dangerous dive. Come on, let's go. I've been diving in oceans all around the U.S. But today, I'll be diving the Atlantic Coral Reef Tank to check out the bonnethead shark. But before I suit off, let's talk with National Aquarium Dive Safety Officer, Josh Veranda. Tell me how you got inspired to scuba dive and get involved in the National Aquarium. Funny enough, my earliest inspiration was actually the National Geographic. They produced a documentary on sharks back in 1982, and that was when I first discovered my, uh, my deep love for sharks. Josh sounds like the perfect guy to teach us about the bonnethead. Another safety diver, Holly, is going to join us. Let's go check out this shark. The bonnethead likes to hang out in the dark areas of the tank. Josh is showering these blue tangs with gravel, which creates a gentle scratching sensation that actually feels good to the fish. Kind of like a back scratcher. But where's the bonnet hat? Look, there it is! Every time I try to get close, it just swims away. Maybe Josh or Holly will have better luck. It's much smaller than I thought, and it kind of looks like a little hammerhead. Very cool. Yeah. How are you? That was awesome. I loved it. Josh, you're the shark guy, right? I'm a big shark guy. So we have the one bonnet head in here. That's and correct. the behavior of this bonnet head is a little bit different than the behavior of most bonnet heads in the wild. Can you explain that to us? And in the wild, bonnet heads would normally inhabit coastal or estuary waters. It's meaning that they want to have some of those flat out open areas near the shore or along the coast, which is why he tends to prefer this section of the tank. Okay, so how, how big is full grown for a bonnet head, would you say? You would normally expect the average adult bonnet head to be about maybe three, three and a half feet. So that's kind of small. If you compare it to a hammerhead, which max size is maybe, what would you say? The max size for the great hammerhead, which is the largest of the family, is about 19 or 20 feet. Wow. That's really long. These bonnet heads are really tiny. Mm -hmm. It's been fun learning about the bonnet head. 
Let's head to the Blacktip Reef where we can learn more about other sharks. I just had an amazing session with my dive buddy, Josh. Now we're at the Blacktip Reef and we can see some new sharks here. What do we have down here? Here in the Blacktip Reef, we actually have several species of sharks, including the Blacktip Reef sharks for which this exhibit gets its name. We also have two species of wobegong sharks. Did he just say wobegong? The tassel wobegong, and we have two ornate wobegongs. There are so many species of sharks that I didn't know about. And lastly, we have one of my favorite sharks, the zebra shark, and we have two of them as well, uh, our large female Zoe and our young male Zeke. What would happen if we didn't have sharks? More species equals more diversity, which means a much healthier, much richer environment. So if sharks are absent, the animals and fish that they consume, their populations will grow and they will consume more resources and occupy more space in these coral reefs. And that means that there's less space and less food for other animals. Who knew that the shark species could be so diverse and have such an impact? Josh, it's been such an amazing opportunity learning all of this stuff about sharks that I didn't know before. What did we learn? We learned that bonnetheads, on average, only grow up to three to four feet long. And they're vital to our marine ecosystem. And this little guy is a member of the hammerhead family. Sharks come in all shapes and sizes and aren't so scary after all. Until next time, everybody. for a fish with big, bright lips and a good set of chompers. And it actually has some pretty spectacular colors too, the change. And if it's not in the mood for visitors, it just triggers its spine and locks itself in a hole and won't come out. That doesn't sound like a very friendly fish now, does it? But it does sound pretty cool. Let's go check out the queen trigger fish. Come on. the National Aquarium to dive in the Atlantic Coral Reef Tank to film the spectacular queen triggerfish that can grow up to 24 inches long, although most are only half that size. Come on guys, let's go! I feel so lucky to get to dive here at the aquarium, where people can come to experience the wonder of the ocean every day. I can't wait to dive in. I love scuba diving. Have you ever wanted to dive deep in the ocean and swim with the fishes? It's an amazing feeling. Just imagine yourself being weightless, seeing fish of all sizes in the most awesome array of colors, getting up close to creatures you thought you'd only see in books. Diving is always an adventure. Let's head over to meet Jackie Cooper the senior assistant dive safety officer who is going to help us find the queen. Let's go! There are hundreds of fish down here, but only a few queen trigger fish in this tank. So wish us luck. Keep a sharp eye out. Remember, it has bright lips and spectacular colors. Jackie found the queen. And there are two of them. Wow. That one just put up its trigger. I wonder what triggered that. I can't believe I'm this close and can see this beautiful fish changing colors. Off they go. Back to their thrones. They really are so beautiful and fast. 
Jackie, that dive was amazing! It was pretty cool! That fish we saw literally changed color. That was a queen trigger fish. Can you tell the difference? Where did it get its name? So it literally has a fin kind of on the top of its head that it can trigger to pop up. And you got to see it do that. I did, yeah, he went right under me. So why did he do that? So he was having a discussion with another queen trigger fish about whose territory that was. Are they typically very defensive with each other? So they're very territorial, and they're always debating whose territory it is. So when we saw him change color, that's exactly what they were doing. He was saying, I'm brighter than you, my trigger is bigger than yours, and this is my territory. But another really cool way they can communicate is they can actually make grunting sounds. What do the queen trigger fish like to eat? almost anything they can catch. Really? They also will feed on crustaceans. Another cool thing that I saw about the queen triggerfish were that they had these things that kind of streamed behind them. What are those? So the largest one has the most amazing streamers and they're always iridescent purple. And that's a sign of his fitness. So that's a male and he is advertising to other members of his species that he is a big, fit, healthy guy. This fish is incredible. What did we learn about queen triggerfish? It likes to trigger its fin up when it's in defense mode. Another really cool thing is they change color depending on their mood. Diving and seeing it up close was so much fun. I'll see you next time on What Sam Sees. Hi guys, it's Sam, your aquatic guide in the Atlantic Coral Reef at the National Aquarium. We're on an awesome ocean adventure, learning some of the coolest facts about fish. Did you know there's a fish in here that can walk on the ocean floor? And it kind of looks like a frog from the side, but when it spreads its beautiful pectoral fins, it kind of looks like a bird. Come on, we've got to go find out more about the flying grenard. I've been scuba diving since I was 15 years old. And every time I go, it transports me to a different world. The calm turquoise waters, floating like an astronaut, treasure hunting for lost objects, and searching for unusual species. And I'm always ready to gear up for the next great adventure. This time, I'm at the National Aquarium, looking for the flying grenard that has fins that kind of look like wings. I'll be diving with Holly Bourbon in the Atlantic Coral Reef Tank. It's 13 feet deep, holds 335,000 gallons of water, and has over 100 species that are found in the Atlantic Ocean. It's absolutely awesome in here. There's a school of blue tang fish, swimming together so gracefully. The tangs are also known as surgeon fish because of the sharp spines on their tails that are kind of like a surgeon scalpel. I better move over for this big guy, the tarpon, nicknamed Silver King because of the bright flash that reflects from its body. Up there! It's the flying grenard! Wow, it just opened its fins. They really do look like wings. So beautiful. And when the wings collapse, it really does look like a frog from the side. 
A Gernard can grow up to as much as 20 inches. I don't want to scare it away, so I'm not getting too close. It likes to hang at the top of the tank with that little bonnet head shark. Come on, Holly's giving us the sign to get out. dry off and talk with Holly in the dive locker, where all of the diving equipment for the aquarium is cleaned and stored. Holly, so we saw that really awesome fish that was kind of up towards the top of the water. He had a little bit of a wing-like feature, right? Yes, yeah, so that fish was called a flying godard, probably about a foot long. The animal's really interesting. What it'll do when it's oftentimes at the bottom, you'll see the wings spread out. And they have this beautiful, um, almost like peacockish look. And it was really bright, and it was right on the edge of its wing, and it was so beautiful while he expanded it. Right, now it looks like a wing, okay. but it's actually called a pectoral fin. Okay. okay. So again, it makes itself look bigger to predators. And you'll typically see those animals sort of walking along the bottom, and that's when oftentimes you'll see those beautiful pectoral fins flare out in that horizontal or flat position. Ours has a little bit unique behaviors. It really likes to stay up in the water column. It's not like they won't get up and swim, just like you're seeing ours in our exhibit, but they really are in the lower, sort of benthic, uh, lower zone in a, in a uh, coral reef system. What kind of food do the Gernards like to eat? They'll more than likely eat more bottom dwellers. Um, ours in the exhibit will eat small pieces of fish. We call it mixed cut because it's a mixed variety, whether it's shrimp, Capelin, smelt. I've heard that they like to make noises underwater. What exactly do they do, or how do they make those noises? That sound you're hearing is, like, is a grunting sound, and it's from inside their, their oral cavity. And so it's a, probably is for attracting other gnards. are so important to the marine ecosystem. Just like all the fish, like the moray eels, the spot fin porcupine fish, the bonnet heads, they all play a part in what I like to call a puzzle. They're part of that diversity of a reef system, so you want that equal balance. What an awesome adventure we had at the National Aquarium. I saw some pretty fantastic fish, like the flying gernard, that can walk on the ocean floor has pectoral fins that look like giant wings and grunts. See you next time on What Sam Feeds. about a pretty awesome fish, but before we do, always remember, safety first. That's why it's important to wear the right gear. A scuba suit keeps me warm underwater. It gets pretty cold down there. My oxygen tank so I can breathe underwater. Flippers help me swim like the fishes. And a mask lets me see the amazing creatures down there. I'm all geared up and ready to go. Let's see what today has in store. Imagine a fish and a porcupine together. Whoa! Sounds like an interesting combo, right? Well, today, we're going on a dive to learn more about the spot fin porcupine fish. Not only does it have a funky name, but it's pretty funky looking too. It can inflate itself with water, puffing up like a water balloon, and when it does, these sharp spines poke out like a porcupine. We'll be looking for the spot fin in this awesome tank with the help of my dive buddy, Jackie Cooper, who looks after the safety of all the divers here at the aquarium. Seeing all these beautiful 
beautiful fish down here makes it so hard to focus on just one. Well, I guess they weren't too hard to spot because Jackie's found one. Just look at how big they are. There are three in here. Two very big ones and one smaller one. Wow, they have such big eyes. And remember, if you get too close, they'll puff up. Just like a porcupine. The spot fin porcupine uses those sharp spines to protect against predators. I better stay back. I don't want to get poked. Let's get out to learn more about this crazy looking fish from Jackie. Okay, Jackie, we saw some spot fin porcupine, right? Yes. So then we had three sport spot fin spot fin porcupine fish. <laughs> Yes. It's really hard to say their name. Some people call them pufferfish. And that's a common term to call them. That's right? a common term to call them, and people call them pufferfish because they can puff up. Why do they puff up? Generally, it's a defensive mechanism. So if they were threatened, they would puff up and something really cool happens. Not only that can they be three times larger, but now they have long spines sticking out. They can grow from about 20 centimeters up to as much as three feet. Three times larger than the size they are already that now? That is correct. Sometimes early in the morning, we can catch them when the lights first come up and they'll puff when nothing's going on and we think that's kind of like stretching as you get out of bed. Me too. I can always use a good stretch in the morning. <sighs> so where did the spot fin porcupine get its name? It's really complicated. <laughs> They're called spot fin porcupines because wait for it. They have spots on their fins. <laughs> Awesome. So another cool name for them, their scientific name, is Diodon hystrix, which sounds really crazy, but it's Greek for two teeth porcupine. They actually only have two teeth? So their upper and lower teeth are fused, so they only have one tooth on the top, basically, and one tooth on the bottom, like a beak. Wow, a beak? This really is a cool fish. Thanks, Jackie, for all the fun fish facts. Guys, today we had so much fun. What did we see? The spot fin porcupine fish. We learned that when he blows up, he has some spikes that stick out. That means he's in defense mode. So a porcupine fish that gets puffed up is just trying to protect itself. We may not have puffer powers, but we can protect ourselves underwater by wearing a scuba suit, oxygen tank, flippers, and a mask. Remember, safety first. Bye everybody, I'll see you on our next adventure. Oceans are filled with so much wildlife. Creatures big and small, the exotic and beautiful, to the wonderfully weird. Hey, it's me, Sam. Wouldn't it be so cool if you could change colors? Well, there's a fish in there that can not only change its colors, but acts just like a chameleon and can blend right into the sand. See? Wait. He was just there a minute ago. Now he's gone. We've got to go see if we can find him. Come on. 
Let's go get suited up and dive down to learn more cool facts about the sand tilefish. the National Aquarium with Senior Dive Safety Officer, Jackie Cooper. We're diving in the Atlantic Coal Reef Tank to check out the sand tilefish. Ready, set, go! Look at all the tropical fish! Jackie says there's nearly 1,000 of them in this tank. That's a lot of fish. Now this is going to be a challenge. To find a fish that likes to blend in the sand among all these creatures? Maybe if I swim closer to the bottom, I might find him in the sand. Whoa! That fish just moved that rock. That's amazing! It's got to be the sand tilefish. It's long and thin. See how it blends and can disappear? First it's there, then it's not. That's a pretty tricky fish. Let's go up and find out what other cool things the sand tilefish can do. Did you see the fish that, that ran the into thing you ever? That was a sand tile fish. It burrows in the sand. That's why they call them sand tile fish. That is so cool. Why do they like to burrow? It's a way of building a safe place to live. Do they use the rocks when they burrow? If you notice, it moved the rock to the top of the burrow so that um, eventually it'll build a little ring of rocks around the entrance to its burrow. And when it goes in its burrow at the end of the day, it'll close the burrow behind it with one of those rocks. It's like its own little door to keep out unwanted guests. What is different about this sand tile anatomy? Did you notice that it was a long fish and it had a really long extended dorsal fin? That lets it dig in the sand and lift heavy rocks and move them around like a longer lever. An adult sand tilefish can grow up to 27 inches, about the size of two rulers. So they're strong and great diggers. Do sand tiles change colors like wean triggerfish do? So they don't turn purple like a queen trigger, but they can change color. And typically when they're showing breeding colors, um, the top of the body will be dark and the bottom half of the body will be light. So it'll almost be like dark on the top and light on the bottom. Did you notice on their face that they have iridescent blue markings? Yes, I noticed them. They were right around the eyes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was really, really pretty. These fish are quite impressive. <laughs> Thanks, Jackie, for taking us along for the dive. Today was so fun. What are some cool facts that we learned about the sand tile fish? They move rocks with their mouth. After they move the rock with their mouth, they use it as a door in their burrow and then close it like, do not enter. A fish that can change colors and make itself invisible to predators? 
That's one super smart fish. Bye, everybody. See you next time on What Sand Seas. It's me, Sam, and I'm at the Turtle Hospital in Marathon, Florida, whose motto is rescue, rehab, and release. So as a rescue diver, this is such an awesome opportunity. She's so cute. Today, we're going to learn about sea turtles, a reptile whose genetic history goes back over 200 million years, since the age of the dinosaur. Let's go meet the turtles and the incredible people who work to save them. the ocean. From the moment my feet touch the blue water, I'm instantly transported to my happy place. One of the most majestic and lovable creatures in the ocean is this little guy. It is also one of the most endangered. Today, I'm meeting Betty Zerfelbach, who is the operations manager at the Turtle Hospital in Marathon, Florida. She gets to work with sea turtles every day. How cool is that? Hi, are you Betty? Uh, yeah, hi Sam. Nice to meet Great you. Great to meet you. Welcome to the Turtle Hospital. I can't wait to see some turtles. Let's go meet some turtles. And here are some juvenile green sea turtles. So their names are on their shell? Yep, similar if you go to the hospital, you have a wristband. You can't really put wristbands on them, but that's just to make sure they're getting the right medications. Although they're very distinctive, if you look at the side of their heads, they have patterns that are unique to them, similar to our fingerprints. They're getting ready to pull Poppy here. She's had some challenges with one of her flippers, a bone infection called osteomyelitis. So we get updated radiographs regularly to see how that's progressing. All right, we're gonna head down here. We'll let them go first. And you can see those plates on their back. Yeah. They're called scoots, and they're made of keratin, the same thing our fingernails are made out of. Scoots are the protective layer of a turtle's shell and can also be found on the skin of a crocodile and the feet of birds. So how did she get this bone disease? She came in for a virus called fibropapillomavirus, and it is something that we see primarily in the juvenile greens. This virus infects the turtle skin outside the shell with warts. Over 50% of green juvenile sea turtles around developed islands, like the Florida Keys, have fibropapilloma. The spread of this virus puts the species at great risk. Poppy's really lucky to be here. Let's go see how her x-ray looks. Most of what we see come in the turtle hospital is human impact, whether it be a virus, you know, from environmental conditions, boat strikes, fishing gear entanglement, plastic or synthetic material ingestion. So we're here to try to mitigate some of that. So next time you are at the beach and see some trash, pick it up. You could be saving a turtle's life. So here you can see her body. Yeah. We can see the flipper joints here. What we're looking at today is this area here. Um, you can see the bone is deteriorated away in this flipper joint. Okay, yeah, um, I see that. So it what looks like a hand right there. It does, very yeah. similar to ours. Wow. So you guys will not release Poppy until that's fully grown? Well, this won't grow back, unfortunately. The okay. bone has deteriorated um, due to infection. And once that stabilizes and she's infection-free, we'll release her. And she still has use of that flipper. Great news. After nearly two years of amazing care and treatment, Poppy's almost ready to be released back into the wild. Time to meet the next patient, Brianna, a loggerhead sea turtle who is getting ready for a checkup. There's Brianna. Wow, <laughs> she's huge. She fabulous. She's got an attitude, this one, so they have to be very careful working with her. Wow. So how can you tell that she is a loggerhead? Good question. They have a very wide head in reference to the size of their body, where a green turtle has a very narrow head. Okay. 
And why did Brianna initially come here? She initially came in for a boat strike, and if you look as they get yeah. her cleaned up, it's going to be easier to see. But you see the back of her shell yep. had a fracture. Um, she was hit by a boat, and that prop cut through the shell and also cut through her spine because the spine of a sea turtle is located right in the back of their shell. And it did some nerve damage, so she doesn't have use of her back flippers. Sea turtles are air-breathing reptiles, which means they can dive deep in the ocean to eat or even rest, but will need to surface to breathe. And she's what we call the bubble butt syndrome, which is kind of silly to say, but it is a thing, the bubble butt syndrome, which means they float and they're not able to go underwater. So for a sea turtle, that means they would starve to death in the wild. We can't release those animals because their food source is at the bottom. We take weights and we adhere them to the back of the shell with some marine epoxy, and that just helps her to be more comfortable, act more like a turtle, okay. and go underwater. But we can't release her with that because those scoots, those plates on their back, they'll continue to grow and shed for her whole life. So eventually those weights will shed off and have to uh, be put back on. So she'll stay here forever? She'll stay somewhere forever. Okay. So right. what we do when they're otherwise healthy is we adopt them out to aquariums all around the world. Okay. Even though Brianna can't go back to the wild, it's great to know she'll still be adopted and have a forever home. All cleaned up and ready to go. Bye, Brianna. We had so much fun at the sea turtle hospital with Betty and her team. Poppy, a green sea turtle, and Brianna, a loggerhead, are getting excellent care here at the turtle hospital. You can tell the difference between loggerheads and green sea turtles just by looking at their heads. Loggerheads get their name because of their big heads. Sorry, no offense, Brianna. While green sea turtles' heads are more narrow. And sea turtles can live up to 100 years, but they are in danger. We can help protect and preserve these amazing species by just using less plastic and putting our garbage in the right place. So remember, recycle, recycle, recycle. See you next time on What Sam Sees. It's me, Sam, and I'm here in the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary to check out a species with boulder-like formations, antler-like branches in all kinds of colors. They sound like plants, right? Well, actually, they're animals. Corals are an endangered species in desperate need of our help. So let's dive down to learn more about them in an amazing underwater research lab that works to protect and preserve our oceans and its marine wildlife. is full of life in an amazing array of shapes and colors. And at the bottom of the ocean floor is one of the greatest natural wonders of our world, corals. Coral are one of the tiniest living organisms in the ocean. They can live alone, but many do something really amazing. They attach themselves to rocks at the bottom of the ocean, divide into thousands of clones, and form beautiful colonies called coral reefs. The Great Barrier Reef off the coast of Australia is the largest coral reef in the world. But today, we're headed to Contrive to dive with Eileen Soto and her team from FIU. We're diving down to check out Aquarius, the only undersea lab in the world, to learn about the research they are doing to protect and preserve coral reefs. Here we go. Aquarius is massive. Its chamber weighs about 80 tons and is 43 feet long. This vessel is like its own ecosystem. The viewports and the base plates on the seabed are all covered with coral formations. This underwater lab is a habitat for marine wildlife and scientists. I've never seen anything like it. Let's go up to learn more about the research that happens in Aquarius. Eileen, that was such a cool dive. 
Can you tell me again what you do? So basically my job is to connect the missions that we're doing at Aquarius to kids all over the world. So we actually have Wi-Fi underwater wow. and we can live link with a group anywhere in the world, anywhere, anytime, and basically bring the coral reef of the Florida Keys to the kids. Wow, mm -hmm. that's incredible. Is there research going on right now? Absolutely. So right now Aquarius is owned and operated by Florida International University. NASA utilizes it through NASA's Extreme Environment missions operations program or the NEMO program so they're also utilizing it pretty much every year to train for long duration space flights and for life in the International Space Station. Astronauts learn a technique called saturation diving where they're trained to breathe underwater to reduce the risk of decompression sickness in extreme environments like outer space. Are there any cool missions coming up? So we actually do have missions coming up and all of them are looking at basically the role that predators play in coral reef ecosystems and looking at the ecology of fear and how predator presence affects the behavior and distribution of the prey species. Okay. So that we can better understand the population dynamics within the coral reef ecosystem. How neat. Nice. Thank you so much for showing it's me this. It's my pleasure. It was great hearing about all the missions, educational programs, and unique ocean science that Aquarius offers. Corals are such fascinating creatures. I can't wait to see more. Now that we've seen them in the day, it's time to check them out at night. I've been a scuba diver for seven years, and this is my first coral night dive. I'm so excited. Let's meet Dr. Miller from NOAA, who specializes in corals, so she can tell us what we might see down there. She and her team of researchers have been diving in this area for the past three nights, observing how corals reproduce, also known as spawning. So, Dr. Miller, it's so nice to meet you. What is your job? I work for NOAA as a coral researcher. Very cool. Corals function to provide that structure in the ocean, to provide habitat for all the different organisms that you see on the coral reef. I heard that you've been out here for a couple of nights already. Okay. It's always a little bit of an adventure because you don't know exactly when the corals are gonna spawn. So we always are out here diving actually six nights during August to make sure that we don't miss it. So, Dr. Miller, what kind of corals are Elkhorn and Staghorn? So, the Elkhorn coral that we're going to see tonight and Staghorn coral are two of the species that are listed under the Endangered Species Act. What kind of threats are they facing right now? Particularly for Elkhorn and Staghorn coral, but all the corals on our reef here, they're very sensitive to warm temperatures. Okay. Corals actually have a very narrow tolerance. So when the temperature of the ocean gets only a couple degrees higher than it should be, corals actually get very sick and die very quickly. And that's through a process called coral bleaching. So corals kind of look like plants, right? They do. But they're actually animals? <clears throat> they are. Corals are pretty special. That's one of the things I think is really cool about corals because they are animals, but they act like plants. So corals actually, just like plants, get most of their energy from the sunlight because they have these tiny plant cells living inside them that photosynthesize as plants do, and the coral's able to benefit from that. So when we're going out on a dive watching for coral spawning, what we're gonna be doing is kind of swimming around and just examining all the elkhorn corals in the area. Well, I can't wait to get down there and see if we find anything. Let's keep our fingers crossed. Yes. I've been waiting for this dive all day. So excited. Let's go. It's really dark down here. Good thing I have this flashlight. Let me stay close to Dr. Miller and the NOAA team. There's some Elkhorn coral and lots of it. That's a marker used to note its locations. You would think they were just rocks. I can't believe they are animals. There's not too much activity tonight. Wait, there's a crab. Hi, little guy. There he goes back to bed. It's been an amazing and long day of diving. It's time to head back up and call it a day. That was really cool. Thank you. That was really cool. After a few hours of sleep, we're meeting up with Dr. Miller and her team to see what they found. Thanks for having me yes, back. Yes, welcome. Welcome to our makeshift field lab and coral 
little baby nursery. It looks like you have millions of babies There here. are probably millions and millions. I would not want to have to count them for sure at this stage. <laughs> but we can estimate from the volume that they're in um, approximately how many we have. Cool. So what are you guys gonna do with them after they develop? So some of the things that we'll be doing are basic experiments to just understand and describe how coral babies um, behave and what they need to be successful. Our other goal is really to use what we learned to be able to help more of these coral babies survive and use them for restoration of the reef to actually get more corals growing back on the reef. such a blast diving with Dr. Miller and getting to see her lab. She and her team are doing such great work for the future of coral reefs. Healthy coral reefs equal healthy oceans and a healthy planet. Also seeing Aquarius with Eileen and the FIU team and learning about all the amazing research being done by diving in the ocean. Corals are super smart. Not only are they animals, but they have plant-like cells that photosynthesize from the sun to help them grow. And they spawn after the full moon in August. Corals are a lot more complex than we thought. So let's be sure to take care of our oceans. See you next time on What Sam Sees. up for a dive in the Atlantic Ocean to check out one of the biggest and baddest predators, sharks. They sometimes get a bad rap. But what if I told you that the scariest oceans are those without sharks? So let's dive in and find out just how important sharks are. hide some of the most diverse and beautiful species. The cute and the cuddly, the creepy and the crawly, the microscopic and the gigantic. They all play a part in keeping a marine ecosystem healthy. Today, I'm so excited because I get to go on my first ocean dive with sharks. These ancient creatures are often misunderstood. So I'm ready to dive in and learn more. I'm in West Palm Beach, Florida, meeting up with Mike Dornellis, also known as Reef Hunter, to check out these big, beautiful fish up close. Hey, hey are you Mike? I am. I'm Sam. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too, Sam. Are we going to see some sharks We're today or what? We're definitely going to see some sharks today. What are we going to see? Uh, possibly bull sharks, maybe some sandbars, maybe some silkies. Who knows? There are more than 400 shark species that live in the oceans around the world swimming in all kinds of depths and temperatures, from the very cold to the more tropical and temperate, like here in Florida. We're heading out about three to five miles from the shoreline to find some sharks. For safety reasons, Florida Fish and Wildlife requires that we avoid bringing them near swimming beach areas. This is to help the sharks not associate food with humans. Most sharks are timid and even docile, so we'll need to use chum to attract them. Chum is like bait, a combination of oily fish scraps ground up that will scatter in the water to encourage them to eat. The captain heard that there are some sharks in the area. I can't wait. Let's go. The water is so clear and blue. Look, there's a shark. Sharks are opportunistic hunters, primarily feeding on smaller fish. Florida has different species of sharks that range in size, from just a few feet to more than 40 feet. This one looks pretty big, more than six feet long. And watch its tail. It helps the shark control its movement, providing balance, speed, and direction. Here's another shark. They don't seem to be afraid of us at all. They're just swimming right up to feed. Sharks don't chew their food. They swallow it whole. Oh no! This shark has a fish hook in its mouth. 
One of the many reasons shark populations are on a decline is from commercial fishing. The shark is showing it's comfortable with us, so Mike's going to gently remove the hook. He gave it a tug, and out it came. That was awesome. The shark seems so happy. It's swimming fast around us like it's saying, thank you. Nice job, Mike. This was a peaceful encounter, but it's best to avoid sharks unless you're an experienced professional. According to my dive computer, we've been down here about 55 minutes already. Time to come up and learn all about what we saw with Mike. Mike, that was an amazing dive. Pretty nuts, huh? So we saw three sharks, right? So what type were they? Those were silky sharks. And what are silky sharks? So silky sharks are a pelagic species. They travel the oceans. They travel in the warm waters. They're very long and sleek. They've got that beautiful copper color with the white underbelly. Yeah. Just a beautiful shark. So how long would you say that they are? Those sharks, I'd say, were around seven, eight feet. Is that like max size? No, they can get a little bit bigger. Those were pretty big silkies. That was a fully grown adult. I know sharks can look scary, but they swam so peacefully around us. I think most of the fear comes from media hype. You don't see too much media about the beauty of sharks. You yeah. know, when you do see something on the news, sadly, it's a shark attack or a shark bite. So that type of media obviously brings negative attention towards sharks. They're very peaceful. Yeah, that was so cool. When we were down there, we were just hanging out with them. They knew we were there. We saw them, but we were just swimming together. I could tell you were comfortable. It was amazing. Yes, I just and... really wanted to get in and get close and touch them. And you could feel how strong they were, too. Yeah, you know, I try to keep as hands off as possible. When I do touch them, it's usually to try to remove hooks or fishing line that's wrapped around them, things yeah. like that. So sometimes you don't have the choice whether, you know, you either back up or you place your hand off and kind of redirect them. When I touched its skin, it felt just like its name, silky smooth. Most sharks have scales, which actually bristle like dog fur, pushing water off the shark so it can move more efficiently. And. I think it's an amazing experience for someone to be able to connect with an animal like that, especially yeah. a shark, when it allows you to. It was amazing. You just want to keep your space and your distance and hope that you'll get to see sharks, right? Yeah, and you know, the perfect scenario, we could come out here and dive and the sharks would come up and hang out with us and that would be amazing. You would never need bait. But <laughs> the tough thing is, in Florida, we have a three mile law, actually. You have to be three miles or more offshore to even be able to chum in the water for sharks. Very cool. So then another thing that I noticed when we were diving was that two of the sharks had some really big hooks in their mouth. Yeah. That was really sad. And this is how big it was. Yeah. Mike was able to get one of the hooks out, but the other shark swam away. Is this what people hunt sharks with? Yeah, that or bigger, actually. This is the good size hook right here. And that's a sad thing. You know, a lot of fishermen land that all oh, the hooks rust out in three or four days, which is completely false. The problem with these big hooks, they are to target sharks. So, you know, when you have small fishing hooks that accidentally get hooked in the sharks, we leave them alone because they do rust out and they don't cause major damage to sharks. That's really sad. So what can we do? Having less fishing line end up in the oceans, it's just cleaning up after, you know, you fish. And if you see it on the shores or anything like that, pick it up and throw it away. On most beaches, there are actually little disposable things that you can put fishing line and old hooks and stuff in the trash. Mike, so what can we do to help stop the depletion of shark species? I think public awareness is one of the most powerful tools. Okay. And today with social media and film and pictures, you know, you are able to really push out in the public a positive image of sharks. Instead of seeing them as killers and mean creatures, you know, to see them as these beautiful, majestic animals that deserve to be protected, just like many other apex and keystone predators in the world. Thanks, Mike. That was such an amazing dive. Sharks aren't so scary after all. They're apex predators, but that doesn't mean that they're man eaters. That just means that they're at the top of the food chain. Sharks are so important. They create balance in our oceans. If shark populations decline, it can cause a ripple effect all the way down the food chain from the larger predators to the smaller fish. So we have to protect them. We can coexist with them. We can scuba dive and have an amazing time without being afraid. We just need to promote awareness. So let's get out there and do it. Hey. 
I'm Sam, and I'm a certified scuba diver who loves the ocean because it's filled with all kinds of amazing creatures, both big and small. It's such a magical place. When I get to explore this underwater world, it's always an adventure. from NOAA, the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration. I'll be going on a dive with John Cachenego, a unit diving supervisor, and Laura J. Grove, a research fishery biologist. Elbow Reef is a popular dive spot here in the Keys. It has some beautiful reef systems that have formed on some very old shipwrecks. These reefs are home to all kinds of marine life. Here we go. Elbow Reef is commonly called Wreck Reef. I see why. I'm holding on to a mooring buoy line that starts at the surface and anchors the boat without creating damage to the reef habitat. It's pretty quiet down here considering coral reefs create homes for about nine million species. Look, a little drumfish swimming in and out of the coral. And a school of tiny mangrove fish playing follow the leader. There's a different species at every turn. This starfish is about the size of my hand. And this is a basket starfish. It's a bit smaller and has twisting tentacles with tiny hooks to catch prey. Really amazing. Hiding behind those rocks is a yellow stingray. Let's get a closer look. Too late, off it goes. Let's get up close to the coral. These buds are one of the tiniest architects of the reef, coral polyps. Coral polyps are super small organisms that attach themselves to rocks on the seafloor and divide into thousands of clones to create colonies that become reefs. This shipwreck's rusted remains are buried under vegetation and coral formations. It's the perfect reef habitat. You can see some parts are still intact, like the bow and decks. These shipwrecks have been grounded since the late 19th and 20th centuries. There are so many awesome species in maritime history living in this reef. Time to dry off and learn more. Jay and John, can you tell me a little bit about what you guys do as your jobs? I am a NOAA Corps officer. I work with a maritime heritage group, map shipwrecks, and uh, I'm also the unit diving supervisor. So I uh, monitor all diving activities within the Florida Keys and ensure everything is safe and everyone is following NOAA policy and standards. So how often do you dive on a weekly basis? Any day that it's nice. Basically, if it's not blowing 15 or more, I'm out on the water. I'm, okay. I'm, this is my office most days. Wow, that's a pretty cool office. And how about you, Jay? I am a research fishery biologist, so I am a scientist, and I do a lot of work with the National Coral Reef Monitoring Program, so I am down there doing assessments of reef fish, so I'm down there often with a fish stick measuring fish and recording information on fish and coral all throughout the Florida Keys, um, Dry Tortugas, and the U.S. Caribbean. That's super neat. Jay has the awesome job of naming any new unknown species she discovers. Now that's pretty cool. So we're here at Elbow Reef, and is this reef actually shaped like an elbow? Actually, yeah. You kind of, if you looked at the chart, here's Florida, right? Yeah. Here's uh, the reef line. Elbow Reef kind of juts out like an elbow here. Okay. So for whatever reason, has attracted several shipwrecks of steamships over the years. I would say that shipwreck is a ship that has gone aground and sank. Or just maybe it didn't go aground, but something caused it to take on water and sink. It was not deliberately sunk. Whereas okay. an artificial reef, people decided we are going to clean this up and try to remove 
all harmful chemicals and substance and deliberately sink it. Okay. Old subway cars, naval ships, and even tires have been sunk to create artificial reefs. Why do they do that? A lot of it has to do with tourism. Tourism, diving, artificial reefs make great fish habitat. They're just a great spot for everybody to visit. One of the most popular artificial reef sites in Florida is the Duane, an old military ship that was intentionally sunk in 1987. These habitats are beautiful, but can be very damaging to these sensitive environmental areas. Biologists generally prefer that these artificial reefs remain as natural as possible. When did those shipwrecks sink? So the acorn went down in 1885. Wow. It was 167 feet. And the Hanna M. Bell went down in 1911. And she was 315 feet. That's a long time ago. Yeah. Based off of the wrecks that we saw on the reef, how can you tell that it's fully established? That's a great question. And it's because if you notice when we were kind of bopping between the natural reef onto the shipwreck, you didn't see a lot of change, right? You didn't see a lot of change in the structure. You saw some of the same um, organisms. You yeah. saw the same corals, the same gorgonians. You saw the same fish. And a newer shipwreck wouldn't necessarily have that. Okay. But it was a seamless transition. And sometimes you would almost have to look down to say, am I over the shipwreck or yeah. am I a natural reef? So yeah, it was hard to tell. So what were some of the creatures that we saw down there, Jay? We saw tons of creatures on the side. We saw two different stingrays, right? Absolutely. You saw a southern stingray and a yellow stingray. The yellow stingrays are ridiculously cute. And he swims pretty fast. Yeah. If you spook him, they definitely will yeah, swim pretty Yeah, I quickly. wasn't trying to spook him. <laughs> Just happened. Yeah. And then we saw a really cool fish that had a long snout and blue polka dots. Yes. What was that? That was a scrawled file fish. That is a awesome fish. That's yeah. super neat. Thanks, guys, for taking me out on this dive. Coral reef systems provide food and shelter to all kinds of species. Reefs also play a very important role in keeping us safe, acting as a barrier to protect our shorelines from damaging waves, storms, and floods. What fan sees? I'm Sam, and I'm in search of a giant fish that's as tall as a Christmas tree and weighs more than a large vending machine. It has a broad head small eyes and an enormous mouth that it uses like a vacuum to suck in its prey in one big gulp. Now that's a fish I've got to see. Let's dive in and learn all about the Goliath grouper. thrives on the diversity of its species. Sometimes those at the top of the food chain get a bad rap. Today, I'm in the beautiful coastal waters of the Florida Keys at Elbow Reef looking for a giant-sized predator, the Atlantic Goliath grouper. This goliath plays a very important role keeping its marine habitat healthy, but its population is declining. We are going on a dive with Laura J. Grove, a research fishery biologist, and John Cachinego, who helps ensure the safety for divers here in the Florida Keys. Fingers crossed we find one. Let's go. This amazing coral reef is filled with all kinds of wildlife. Like this cute little green sea turtle munching on seagrass. Unlike land turtles, sea turtles have flippers instead of feet. 
and these paddle-like flippers make them super speedy swimmers. Sea turtles travel long distances and dive deep in the ocean to eat, but need to surface to breathe. Juveniles hide in the vegetation from ambush predators like sharks, grouper, and barracuda. They're always on the lookout for food. Here comes one now, a huge silver-colored barracuda with razor-sharp teeth. This torpedo-shaped fish can grow as large as six feet long and weigh up to 103 pounds. Barracudas live near coral cool reefs and shallow waters, hoping to surprise their prey with a sneak attack, a tactic used by the Goliath grouper, too. The grouper should be pretty easy to spot, but we haven't seen one yet. We've searched the more shallow, artificial, and natural reefs, which are their favorite hiding places, but no luck. We're going on another dive later today, so maybe we'll find one then. Let's head up to talk with Jay and John about the other species we saw. So what were some of the creatures that we saw down there, Jay? We saw tons of creatures on this dive. There are a lot of different things going on down there. And I think one of the things that the coolest is is that you don't have to be a fish expert to understand what a fish does down there or what kind of style it has. So you saw the barracuda. Yes. A huge one. Huge barracuda. Huge barracuda. We saw parrotfish. Tons of parrotfish. All different colors, shapes, sizes. We saw some terminal-faced parrotfish. So parrotfish are pretty unique. They change colors throughout their life. They have different phases. So even though there are tons of different colors down there, we primarily saw about three species. That's yeah. super neat. It's time to head back to the dock to get ready for my second dive. But I still have lots of questions. I didn't get to talk to you about the Goliath grouper. Yes, the Goliath grouper, the biggest grouper in the Atlantic. It's awesome. Unfortunately, we didn't get to see one, though. So what do groupers look like, Goliath groupers? Groupers are kind of a funny-looking fish. They are, you don't see their scales like you see in some other fish. They look smooth to the touch. Um, they have very soft, rounded fins and are known for having a grumpy, frowny face with a just big lips and a big mouth. And the eyes are kind of small, right? The eyes are really small. How big do Goliath groupers get? Goliath groupers are awesome. They get huge. They get over eight feet and about over 800 pounds. I've heard people say 1,000 pounds. They're a gigantic wow. fish. Where do they typically like to hang out? Goliath grouper hang out in a bunch of different areas. You can find the adults on natural reefs, so on the coral reef habitat. In some areas, they're found on larger artificial reefs. And the juveniles are found in the mangroves. A lot of species have that life strategy where they have their young that's not in an area on the coral reefs with all the larger predators. And the mangroves, um, they're able to hide behind the roots so that they don't have to escape predation as easily. And then and when they get larger and there's not enough food for them anymore, then they make their way back out into the reef where there's more opportunity. Adult goliath grouper feed on crustaceans like lobsters, shrimp, crabs, fish, and even young sea turtles. They're considered to be an ambush predator, which means that their they body type has a little bit of cryptic coloration, and they'll shut their mouth and essentially create this negative pressure, this ability that when they open up their mouth, the water comes shooting in, and they ambush that prey. And that prey, by, before they know anything happens, they're already in the Goliath grouper's stomach. Oh, And it's kind of sad. That is sad. But they're very successful. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully we'll be successful in finding the Goliath grouper in this next dive. Here we go. It's so beautiful down here. These coral formations are so vibrant. I know they look like plants, but they are actually animals. Swimming around the reef are stingrays, schools of fish, parrotfish, and barracuda. It's a beautiful sight. We're looking in the crevices and ledges of the reef and in the vegetation for the Goliath grouper, but still no sign. We may not have found the grouper, but that's why I love scuba diving. You never know what you're going to find. 
The Goliath grouper is an impressive fish. It's considered an umbrella species because its survival ensures the survival of other species that share its habitat. Today was a lot of fun. We saw a lot of amazing creatures like the green sea turtle, parrotfish who change colors throughout their life, and barracudas. Barracudas and Goliath grouper are ambush predators that surprise their prey and swallow them whole. Goliath grouper is pretty awesome. Let's protect these critically endangered species for the greater good of all species by not overfishing or destroying their habitat. Thanks for joining me on this adventure. See you next time on What Sam Sees. headquarters in Key Largo, Florida, ready to find out about a fish that's been invading the waters. This beautiful but skilled predator will eat anything that comes in its path, the lionfish. Its population is exploding, and we've got to find out why. This is where all the work happens, right here. The lionfish is beautiful with striking features. Its population is growing here in Florida and all around the US. Native to the tropical waters of the Indian and Pacific Oceans, lionfish were first spotted far away from home in the Atlantic Ocean 15 years ago. It is believed that humans are responsible for the release of these fish from aquariums into the wild. These skilled predators' big appetite is impacting the health of our oceans. I'm here at REEF, the Reef Environmental Education Foundation, meeting up with Lad Atkins, the director of special projects to find out more about this spectacular fish. Hi, Sam, I'm Lad. Nice Welcome to meet you. To Reef headquarters. Can you show Come me on. around? Yeah. This is uh, one of our offices. This is where all the work happens, right here. Very cool, so what is everybody doing? Well, how about if I let you come around and meet the staff? Sure. I'm Sam. Hi, I'm Amy. Nice to meet you. What are you doing? Uh, I plan dive vacations for people all over the world to go and collect fish survey data. Wow, that's super awesome. Where are you planning a dive right now? Um, the next trip we have is to Curacao, and then we are also running on to the Sea of Cortez. Oh, cool. Where's Curacao? In the Caribbean. Very neat. I see you have a little furry friend yeah, under there. Yeah, I do. This is Wimla. Oh, hi. That's a great office mate. What are you doing? I manage the Summer 2017 Lionfish Derby Series. The Lionfish Derby is an annual event to promote lionfish education and awareness. It's a one-day competition where teens dive and snorkel to catch as many lionfish as possible. Prizes are awarded for the biggest, smallest, and most lionfish caught. And you guys just had that yesterday, right? Yeah, we had our last derby for the summer. I heard it was a ton of fun. Yeah, it was really fun. We had the festival in, um, with the derbies. And how many lionfish did you catch? We got 220 yesterday, so over 2,000 for the whole summer. The team here at Reef is doing such great work to educate and inspire the community to care about the conservation and protection of marine populations. So I have lots of questions here. about the lionfish. So let's sit down with Lad to learn more. Here, you can have the seat. Okay, thanks. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's good to have you here. So can you tell me a little bit about what you do here at Reef? One of my main focuses is addressing uh, non-native species, things that don't belong where they're being found now. Okay, like the lionfish. Exactly like lionfish. Divers first spotted lionfish off the coast of North Carolina in 2002. 
Since then, the population has spread to parts of the Atlantic and Caribbean, with recent estimates of 200 lionfish per acre. They stalk their prey, almost anything that moves to attract their attention okay. and that they can fit in their mouth, sometimes larger than half their own body size. Yeah, I was just going to ask, how big is their mouth? It's big, wow. and, and they feed with the suction. Just like up. grouper? Very much like Rupert. They okay. sneak up close to their prey, make a rapid rush forward, and open the mouth at the same time. That creates a vacuum that sucks the prey right in. They don't bite it in half. They don't chew it up. It just goes down whole. And how big can lionfish get? Well, in their native range, they get to about a foot. Okay. But here, we are seeing lionfish much larger than that. Wow. Close to uh, 20 inches. Yes, they get much larger here than their native range, probably because they don't have the same pressures. They don't have predators here. They don't have parasites here. Where they don't belong in this area, it's kind of a free-for-all. And why do they have very few predators? They are very well equipped with venomous spines. And if you're a potential predator, that is not something that you want to make a meal out of. OK, and how many spines do they have on their bodies? Well, they have 13 very long, very prominent spines across the back. Okay. But they also have five spines on the bottom, two up forward and three back by the tail. Are all of them venomous? Luckily, lionfish are not aggressive. OK. But they can be defensive, so they tend to stand their ground. They're quite bold because they don't have predators here. So it's great to be able to swim up and look at a lionfish, but you don't want to reach out and try to grab it or pet it. Mm -hmm. And if you're around structure, you want to give it a little bit of distance, because that's typically where you're going to find lionfish. Lionfish are one of the top predators in many coral reef habitats in the Atlantic Ocean. What do you do to keep their populations low? Yeah, well, what we're finding is that where people are not removing lionfish, the populations are just skyrocketing. And that's part of the problem. The Lionfish Derby is a great example of how Reef is educating the public about lionfish and getting them involved. So as scuba diver, how should we interact with lionfish in the wild? Yeah, so one of the great things about divers and snorkelers is that they're able to find lionfish mm -hmm. and remove them, okay. either by hand netting fish, and we can help protect our native marine life by removing the lionfish that don't belong here. And we're allowed to do that? It depends on where we are. But here in the Florida Keys, it's not only allowed, but it's encouraged. Only divers with a permit can catch these unwelcome fish. Probably one of our only saving graces is that lionfish are really good to eat. OK. I mean, they're a delicacy. People clamor for lionfish. Lionfish are venomous, but not poisonous to eat once the spines are removed and the meat is prepared. Many restaurants are adding this tasty delicacy to their menu in efforts to spread awareness about this species. The more we study about lionfish, the more we learn, and the more effective we can be in our removal efforts. I had such a great time learning lots about lionfish with Lad. They're an impressive species because they can eat anything that fits into their mouth. They're also invasive because they're not native to the Atlantic Ocean. This majestic predator has found itself far away from home creating major impacts on its new habitat and the wildlife in it. So we have to do our job, like Lad and his team, to promote awareness and control the lionfish population. See you next time on What Sam Sees. and I'm in Baltimore, Maryland at the National Aquarium, ready to learn about a super smart marine mammal that is surprisingly similar to humans, dolphins. They're truly a fun and lovable creature. So let's go behind the scenes to learn more about them and the amazing people who care for them.
The ocean is home to some of the most diverse and beautiful creatures, all moving in their own rhythm and pace. And dancing through the waves are the acrobats, court jesters, and aerial spinners of the sea. Dolphins. Today, I get to go behind the scenes at the Dolphin Discovery Exhibit in the National Aquarium. I'm meeting up with Susie Walker and her team to check out the dolphins' daily routine. A typical day starts at 6.30 in the morning with breakfast. It takes the team two hours to sort and weigh 200 pounds of fish that make up the dolphins' diet. Today's fish. They are fed every hour and a half, about seven to 10 times a day. In addition to their diet, food is an important part of their learning through positive reinforcement. The trainers use food in a series of play and reward sessions to teach certain behaviors and build trust with the dolphins. Susie, can you tell me a little bit about what you do here at the aquarium? Sure, I am a trainer, so that means that I help take care of our animals. Another part of it is teaching them behaviors that help us take care of them, monitor their physical health. So okay. we, can, we can collect samples of blood or other things. Can you give me a little history on the dolphins that you have here? Sure, we have seven dolphins. Five of them are girls and two of them are boys. And all of them except one were born here okay. at Dolphin Discovery. One of them was born at another aquarium and we provided a new home for her when she needed a new home. So okay. all of these guys were born in, in human care. Let's head to the first training session of the day with Taylor. I love marine mammals. They're my favorite. Cetaceans, yeah. whales, porpoises, and dolphins. So right now, Chesapeake is our oldest dolphin, and she's 25 years old. She knows a lot of fun sounds. And she's our only dolphin that will blow her a raspberry. Oh, what's that? So it's like a, well, we'll have her show you. OK. <laughs> Whoa. So I see they have a lot of teeth. Do they use them? They actually use their teeth to catch the fish that they eat. When they close their teeth, their teeth interlock kind of like a zipper. OK. And that traps the fish. But oh, OK. If you notice if she's eating, they swallow their food whole. Dolphins learn by imitating their trainer's behaviors and gestures. And like dogs, they're always ready for a treat. Most of our water work is mimicry related, and it's all based on relationship building. What do you so, mean by mimicry related? So we can do some mimics with her. You want to stand up? Okay. We'll spin in a circle one time, and okay. she'll follow us. So okay. Go ahead and spin. Oh. So dolphins learn very quickly by mimicking each other as well as us. Um, so when we do a behavior very small like that, they're like, oh, hey, I can do that too, and that's really fun. And that's a great way for us to build a relationship with them and build trust. Okay. You take your right hand, hold them near. Give her a nice big wave. She'll wave back. <laughs> and then one of our favorites, if you take your hand like this, hopefully she won't get us too wet. Might get a little wet. And then go ahead and slap the ledge. Good <laughs> job. She's just very good at copying. Wow. All right, we're gonna take a quick step back. Do you please say bye? Bye. Aww. Good job. <laughs> The exhibit opens to the public daily to let them see how dolphins learn, play, and interact with each other. These sessions help educate visitors about dolphins. Now that I've seen them in action, I want to learn even more about their social behavior. So some of the social behaviors that you see here, would you see those also in the ocean? Yes. They're very touchy. 
touchy animals, and that's kind of how they bond with each yeah. other. So they'll rub their flippers along each other's bodies. They'll whistle and click to communicate with each other. So they're very social with each other. Correct, yes. So they like to remain in pods, you would say? Correct, yes. A typical pod size for a bottlenose dolphin is going to be a few individuals to maybe 20, whereas something like another species called a spinner dolphin, it's not unusual to see 100 or 200 of them in a group at a time. So each each species is a little different. And do they work together when they're in pods? Yes, what absolutely. Do they do? Yes, they look out for each other. If they're resting, they don't completely sleep like we do. They okay. sleep with one eye closed. They sleep with one eye closed? That's so funny. What's interesting is we believe that they sleep with one half of their brain at a time. What? So they're never completely asleep. Why do they do that? If you think about it, when you're out in the ocean and you're kind of looking around, you got to keep your eyes open. You don't want to have both your eyes closed. You could run into something. Yeah. Do they use echolocation in yes. pods? Yes. What is echolocation? Echolocation is a way for them to find their way around if water is either dark or murky. Okay. So what they do is they make these clicking sounds. They go out into the water in front of them, and they bounce off things in their path. So the click bounces, and then the dolphin can listen to the echo. So they can kind of see through sound. Wow. So what's a lifelong plan here for your dolphins? Well, currently our plan is to find a brand new home for them. OK. After careful consideration, the National Aquarium has decided to build and relocate their dolphin colony to a more naturalistic seaside sanctuary. And what's going to be neat about this new home is that it will be in an ocean-type habitat. Do dolphins in the wild face any threats right now? Yes, pretty much every ocean animal out there. Our oceans are in trouble, so we are trying to figure out how we can help. We like to share our animals here at Dolphin Discovery with our guests. So we think about our dolphins as ambassadors yeah. for their species. So they are sort of being the voice for their kind yeah. out in the ocean. Well, thank you for sharing this experience with You're me. You're welcome. Yes, my pleasure. We learned so much about dolphins today, like they sleep with one eye open, keeping half of their brain running. Dolphins are so important to our marine ecosystem. They provide clues about the health and safety of other ocean creatures, as well as humans. They also see through sound using echolocation, which helps them better navigate through the oceans. And the dolphins that we met here today serve as ambassadors for dolphins all over the world. So please be sure to take care of our oceans. See you next time on What Sam Sees.